Blessed be the name of the Lord. We give God all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, for he is worthy to be praised. Amen. Come on in. Come on in, Facebook Live, and the ones on the line. Come on in. To crucify the flesh. To crucify the flesh. Magnify the Holy Spirit. Come on in, Facebook Live. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Magnify the Holy Spirit. Magnify the Holy Spirit in your life. That when Jesus told the disciples that he must go away, but he would leave a comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. Giving God all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Come on, let's study the word of God. Amen. To God be the glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We give him all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. I'm Pastor Charlene Neal Keat with a journey into wholeness, cathedral, worldwide ministries where the flesh is crucified, the Holy Spirit is magnified, and God is glorified. And we give him all the glory, all the honor, all the praise because he's worthy. Hallelujah. Come on, we've been studying the four Gospels, and we are in the book of Mark, the of the Gospel according to Mark, amen? Mark 11, to God be the glory. Come on in, come on in. Magnify the Holy Spirit and glorify God. Let's get ready to study the book of Mark according, the gospel according to Mark. Mark 11, we're in the book of Mark 11 tonight. We have got, gotten to chapter 11, hallelujah. Get your Bibles, get your Bibles. Sister Suburban, thank you for tuning in tonight. Missed you being on before. I pray that you're doing well. <clears throat> And I know that God is comforting your heart. Hallelujah. I know that he is your comforter, my dear. And I know that he is with you during this time of a challenging time. Hallelujah. I know you know, but know that Pastor Keith's been praying for you consistently. I love you. God bless you. And may the angels of the Lord encamp around about you, for comforting you, protecting you during this time of grief. Amen? Amen. So thank you for being on. Well, put the glasses on. I'll be able to see. Hallelujah. Uh, Tucker, last name Tucker. Lorraine Tucker. Thank you. I know some Tuckers. Thank you for tuning in to tonight. Get your Bible. Get your Bible. We're in the book of Mark 11. And we're studying the book of <clears throat> Mark chapter 11. We've been studying the Four Gospels, we've gotten into Matthew, finished with Matthew, and we are about finished with uh, the book of Mark. Amen? So I hope you have your Bibles. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you. 
We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to study your word with your people. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise, knowing there is not, nothing too hard for you, God. In this life, Father, you tell us that we will have tribulations, but you tell us to be of good cheer, that you overcame and we will too. So we, Lord, we honor you. We praise you. We thank you, God, that we are believers and we know without a shadow of a doubt that you will take care of us. And we thank you, God, for being patient with us as we grow and develop in you and mature in your word, God, even the more. So, Lord, we just honor you. We praise you. We thank you. We thank you, God, that you, Holy Spirit, that you remind us of where you brought us from and where we are now. We have so much to praise and honor you for. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I give you glory. I give you honor. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. Hallelujah. To be able to study your word here in the United States of America. So many have heard about Jesus and can't freely uh, 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 acknowledge him. But, Lord, we can. So, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for comforting Sister Suburban. We thank you, God, for comforting, comforting the Teague family and the Schaffner family. As my Felicia Schaffner, as she is out of the hospital now, God, but still healing. Hallelujah. Knowing what direction to go, God. But, Lord, you know all things. You tell us in your word, you know the beginning of the thing. You know the end of a thing. So nothing's too hard for you, God. So I ask you, Holy Spirit, to lead, guide, and order her steps in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we honor you. We, who God, thank you. Thank you, Father. There is no one like you, Father. We serve a mighty God, Prince of Peace, Abba, Father. And Lord, you wish that none should perish, that all shall have eternal life. Give us the strength to serve you, God, because we know that you are a keeper. You said that you will keep our minds in perfect peace who stayed on you. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to go to work. Get up this morning. Go to work in our right minds, God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. To God be the glory. Amen. You, do, you ladies have your Bibles. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let me get my message here. So the topic of discussion this tonight is Jesus ministry in Jerusalem. Jesus ministry in Jerusalem. And as I previously stated, the scripture reference is Mark 11. And this is where the triumphal, his triumphal entry, he entered Jerusalem. So it reads as the verse one, it says, when they were nearing Jerusalem at Beth Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples. And this is what he told them. He said, saying to them, he said, go into the village in front of you. And immediately as you enter it, you will find a donkey's, a colt, a colt tied, which has never been written by anyone. Un he said, untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? This is what you say. He said, say the Lord needs it. And then he told him, he said, and immediately he will send it. He will send it here. Verse four. <clears throat> so they went away to the village. And found a colt tied outside at a gate in this in the street, and they untied it. Some of the people who were standing there said to them, "What are you doing untying the colt?" They replied to them, just as Jesus had directed, and they allowed them to go. So Jesus told them, "Say, you go in and you get the colt for me and bring it back." He said, "If anyone asks you, he said, you just tell them that you bringing it to me." And they were obedient. I tell you, God knows all things. That's evident. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. They replied to them just as Jesus had directed and they allowed them to go. They brought the colt to Jesus and put their coats on it. So they laid their coats on top of it before Jesus got on it. And he sat on it. And many of the people spread their coats on the road as an act of tribute and homage before a new king. 
and others scattered a layer of leafy branches, which they had cut from the fields, honoring him as Messiah. So, you know, the people, who hallelujah, brothers and sisters, this was Sunday. This was a Sunday of the week that Jesus would be crucified. Now, just think about it. He's being obedient to the Father. He knows what he's getting ready to face. In this flesh, it didn't feel good. But guess what? He trusted the Father. So, so he, was, he was getting ready to be crucified. And the great pa a Passover, which was a festival, was about to begin. Jews came to Jerusalem from all over the Roman world during this time, beloved, during this week-long celebration to remember the great exodus uh, uh, from Egypt. You know about the exodus of, of Egypt. Exodus 12, verse 42 makes us aware of this, and it talks about the ordinance of the Passover was a right of watching to be observed for the Lord for having brought them out of the land of Egypt. So the purpose of the Passover is to well, worship and honor God. He bought them out of Egypt. This same night is the Lord to be observed and celebrated by all the Israelites throughout their generations. Many of the crowds had heard of the of, of or seen Jesus and were hoping he would come to the temple. John 11 verse 15 through 57 is evident of this. And this is what it says. It said, now the Passover of the Jews was approaching and many from the country went up to Jerusalem before Passover to purify themselves, meaning ceremonially, so they uh, would be able to participate in the feast. So they, were, <clears throat> so they were looking for Jesus as they stood in the temple area and saying among themselves, what do you think? Will he, come, will he not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he was to report it so they might arrest him. Now these religious leaders, these Pharisees, see they heard about John the Baptist. I don't want to go above myself, but I tell you, they, these, these are religious people. That's why I always say we have to build a relationship with God. We have to study his word and get in his word and, and allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. We can't do this thing on our own. We have to stay connected to the lifeline. <laughs> mm. He's the vine with the branches. We got to stay connected. Verse, verse 9 through 10. Hallelujah. Of Mark 11 goes on to say this. Those who went in front, we're in verse 9. Those who went in front and those who were following him were shouting in joy and praise. This is what they were shouting. They said, Hosanna, meaning save. I pray. He said, Hosanna, save. Hallelujah. Uh, 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 because the people realized, beloved, that Jesus was fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah 9, verse 9. See, things are prophesied and then they come to pass. It goes back to the fivefold ministries. If we called into ministry, we pastor, teacher, evangelist, apostle, and uh, did I say prophet? prophet the fivefold ministry. So, so this was prophesied by Zechariah uh, in 9, verse 9. Say, blessed, praise God. He is he who, who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. He said, Hosanna in the highest, meaning heaven. The crowd correctly saw Jesus as the fulfillment of these prophecies. Mm -hmm. But they did not understand where Jesus' kinship would lead him. They didn't understand. Only a few days later, another crowd would cry out. A few days later now, they're saying, Hosanna, save. In other words, save me, Lord. Pray, we pray. And then a few days later, this is what they said. They crying out, crucify him. When Jesus stood on trial before them. See, see, that's why 
I, I can't remember where exact where it is, but you know, we sometimes we become fickle. That's why we have to go through some things, experience some things with the Lord, and He can allow us to mature in Him and grow in Him. Hallelujah. Because the same ones, when He walked in on the cult, hallelujah. He didn't have to walk in on the cult. He's, he's got, he's, who Jesus. He came, he could have came in the finest, but He came in a cult. He sent His disciples to get the cult. Hallelujah. Let me get my air, my fan on. It's hot in here. Hold on one minute. Jesus. Glory to your name, God. Glory to your name. And it said a few days later, they, the same people cried out, crucify him. When Jesus stood on trial before them. Verse 11 through 14 of Mark 11. Reads as follows. It said Jesus entered Jerusalem. And went to the temple. And, and, and after looking around in every, at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve disciples. Because it was already late in the day. Verse 12. On the next day, when they had left Bethany, he was hungry. This is what he did. I, I thought this was so interesting. Excuse me. On the next day. When when he when they had left Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing at a distance, he saw a fig tree. Hallelujah! A, a fig tree and leaf. He went to to see if he he would uh, find anything on it, but he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for the figs. He said to it, "Now he's hungry. This is what he said to it: <laughs> No one will ever eat fruit from you again." And his disciples were listening to what he said. Beloved, <clears throat> this incident occurred early in the spring when the leaves were beginning to bud. Mm -hmm. And Jesus saw it from a distance. He's hungry. He's ready to get some, some fruit off the, the fig tree. The figs normally grow as the leaves fill out. But this tree, though full of leaves, had no figs. The tree looked uh, promising, but offered no fruit. Now listen to me intently. The tree looked beautiful. It had beautiful leaves, ready to be bought. Hallelujah. But it had no fruit. Jesus' harsh words to the fig tree could be applied to the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. You know all about Israel, I know. If you've been walking with me long enough, we studied those Israelites. Hallelujah. Fruitful in appearance only. Israel was spiritually barren. Now you can look at that in the natural, hallelujah. Well, it's only in the spirit in our lives. We can appear in church all dressed up. Hallelujah. Praise God. We can appear fruitful in the Lord. We even know the language, hallelujah. But spiritually barren. No fruit. Mm. You say, Pastor, how can you have no fruit in you? know the lingo. You know, spending time with him. When opposition come, trials and tribulation come, you go, I don't want no more to do with this. We get offended quickly. Just like the people, what, a few days later, what, they were saying, hallelujah, hallelujah, save us. The next thing, the least little thing he did, crucify him. Hallelujah. But as you grow on this journey, you realize some things. Not that you're judging anyone, because you know you had to grow to a certain place, and you're still growing, and will continue to grow. But some things we should get past. Amen? And the only one that can help us is Jesus. We become more like him. As lo as mo the more we spend time with him, the more we become more like him. But, you know, sometimes he would tell us to move. He would tell us, don't deal with that. You know, the season is over for that. Amen? Hallelujah. Verse 15 through 17 of Mark 11 makes us aware of what Jesus did next. Sammy Lewis, welcome. Welcome. Good to see you, brother. Uh, it says, then they came to Jerusalem. 
and he entered the temple grounds and began driving out with force the people who were selling and buying animals for sacrifice. Now, now I think some of us know what's going on here in the temple area. So they was buying and selling animals for sacrifice in the temple, in the church. <laughs> Jesus. No, in the temple area. And overturn he's okay, with force the people were selling and buying animals for sacrifice in the temple area. And overturned the tables of the money changers who made a profit exchanging foreign money for temple coinage and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he's verse 16. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise, a household wares, through through the temple gra grounds using the temple area, uh, using the temple area. He began, verse seventeen. He began to teach <clears throat> and say to them, "Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a robber's den." Beloved, what we must realize is that Jesus did uh, become, he became angry, but he did not sin. Hallelujah. There is a place for righteous indignation. We all, we righteous, we stand for righteousness. And some things we see, so to speak, that come down the pipe in our lives are what people, we know it's not godly because we know what the word say. We, he, you know, he, it, it's called righteous indignation. Christians are right to be upset about sin and injustice and should take a stand against them. But unfortunately, beloved, believers are often passive about these important issues and instead get upset about people, about person, a person insults and petty irritation. In other words, political issues, are, which we shouldn't be so political, but we should vote. We should take a stand for certain things. But the Bible says, in the study of Bible, it said that sometimes Christians are the most passive ones. But we should, but we get upset about, per, uh, you know, personal insults or, or, or irritated by petty things. We must make sure that our anger is directed toward the right issues. Amen. Furthermore, the money changers and merchants did big business during the Passover. Now, this is a holy time, but they did big business. You know how it is in these conferences. <laughs> People who came from foreign countries had to have their money changed into temple currency because this was the only money accepted for temple tax and for the purchase of sacrificial, sacrificial animals. Uh-huh. He said, after inflated uh, exchange rate enriched, enriched the money changers and the ex, uh, prices of animals made the merchants wealthy. The stalls were set up in the temple's court of the Gentiles, making it all impossible for non-Jews to spend time in worship. Isaiah 56, verse 6 through 7 makes us aware of this, and this is what it reads. It says, also the foreigners who joined themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath without profaning it and holds fast to my covenant, meaning my conscious obedience, mm -hmm, being conscious and being obedient to God, Verse 7, all these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all, for all the people. So it's evident, beloved, that Jesus became angry because God's house of worship had become a place of extortion and a barrier to uh to Gentiles who wanted to pray, who wanted to worship God. Mm -hmm. Verse uh, 18 through 23 of Matthew 11, it, the, it says the chief priests and the scribes heard this and began searching for a way to destroy him. Miss Patricia Waters, thank you for tuning in. God bless you. Um, 
The chief priests and the scribes heard this and began searching for a way to destroy him, for they were afraid of him. Say the chief priests and the scribes were afraid of Jesus. And they were trying to figure out a way to destroy him. See, when we don't spend time with God, and we and the Holy Spirit not uh, and allow the Holy Spirit to put an unction in our life, He could be standing right in front of us, and we don't even know it. Said the chief priests and the scribes heard this and began searching for a way to destroy him, for they were afraid of him, since the entire crowd was struck with astonishment at his teaching. People get jealous of your teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples would leave the city. In the morning, as they were passing by, the disciples saw that the fig tree had withered away from the roots up. Because he cursed it. You remember we talked about the fig tree? He, it was cursed. And remember, Peter said to him, this is what he said. He said, Rabbi, meaning master, look, the fig tree with, which you curse has withered. Jesus replied, this is what Jesus said. He said, have faith in God constantly. Not with things just, uh, this is pastor adding to it. Not with things just look good. He said constantly. Not with things are going, are not going your way. Or you getting some lash back from your ch children or, or whatever the, or it's not going good on your job or whatever the case may be. He said, your, the faith, you have, have faith in God. God is saying have faith in Him constantly. Verse 23, he said, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. He said, in God's unlimited power, he said, but believe that what he says is going to take place. It will be done for him in accordance with God's will. That's the key. As long as it's God's will, beloved. It will come to pass because God is a loving God, a loving father, and he knows what's best for you. He knows what's best for me. Amen. Hallelujah. Beloved, the kind of prayer this was talked about that, mo that moves mountains is prayer for the faithfulness of God's kingdom. It, was, it would um, seem impossible to move a mountain into the sea. So Jesus used the illustration to show that God can do what we consider impossible. He can do the impossible. Just like he spoke to that fig tree and came back and it was withered. God will answer our prayers, but not as a result of our positive mental attitude. I would like to give you four conditions that must be met. Mm -hmm. Four conditions that must be be met. God will answer our prayers, but not as a result of our positive mental attitude. But there are four conditions that must be met. Number one, you, you must be a believer. Mm -hmm. You mean, you say, you mean to tell me, Pastor Keith, that God doesn't hear my prayers because I'm not a believer? I'm just telling you what the word Say, you must be a believer. Number two, you must not hold a grudge against another person. You must not pray with selfish motives and your request must be for the, for the good of God's kingdom. Sisters and brothers, to pray effectively, you need faith in God, not faith in the object of your request. Now, I know before I became to Christ. I was a sinner. Hallelujah. Now I'm a sinner saved by grace. Because I'm just as possible can sin because I'm still in this body. Hallelujah. And then some of your thoughts. So you always have to have a repentance heart. So when I went, when the Holy Spirit led me, just talking about prayer, when he led me, hallelujah, I prayed the sinner's prayer and came to him. And made him savior of my life. And then he be began to become Lord of my life. Talking about me. Hallelujah. Because I believe that you have to grow from glory to glory to glory. Which is the word of God. It says that. 
that we will go from glory to glory in him. But it takes us studying his word, going to church, going to Bible study, hallelujah, and doing your private time. Pray to the Father, asking him what, you know, just make sure you keep him first, amen? And he will do his job, and you will know, hallelujah. So sisters and brothers, to pray effectively, you need faith in God, not faith in objects of your request. Keep walking with me. Verse 24 goes on to say this. It said, for this season, I am telling you, whatever things you ask for in prayer, in accordance with God's will. He said, believe with confidence and trust that you have received them and they will be given to you. I know I've asked God for some things. One thing in particular, but I've asked him for some things and it has not come to pass yet. So I just wait patiently. Because I know that I know that it's his will. But if it's his will, it will come. Amen. Jesus, our example, uh, pray, prayed. Jesus, our example, prayed. Everything in this passage I'm talking about, everything is possible for you. Yes, yet, not what I will, but your will be done. And this is this was also prayed in Mark 14:36. Beloved, our prayers are sometimes motivated by our own interests and desires. Mm -hmm. If you agree with it, say amen, Pastor. Amen. <laughs> or type amen. We, we like to hear that we can have anything, but Jesus prayed with God's interests in mind. Mm -hmm. If we receive answers to prayer, who, who would get the credit? If we receive answers to prayer, ask yourself, who would I who would I give the credit? Oh, I pray. You know, I, I, I took some time and got on my knees and you know, and I pray, hallelujah. Who would get the credit? When we pray, we can express our desires, but we should want God's will above ours. Amen. We must check ourselves to see if our prayers focus on our interests are his. Hallelujah. I do a lot of pondering. So we should, we should make sure that our prayers focus on our interests, interests are here, his. You say, well, pastor, it's got to be mine because I'm asking him. Okay. But you know, it's his will be done. Not thy will. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 25 through 26 of Mark 11 continues with this. It says, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, he said, forgive him or her, meaning drop the issue, let it go. You said, but they hurt me, pastor. I ain't letting it go. This is what the Lord said. He said, so that your father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions and wrongdoings against him and others. Uh-huh. But if you do not forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive your transgressions. Forgiving others is tough work, beloved. So much so that many people would rather do something totally distasteful than offer forgiveness to someone who has wronged them. I know we all been there. Come on, let's be real. I've been there for God. Because I, I, I just had someone recently say, you know, how? I said, well, you know what the word say. Tell me how, what, what God said in this word. How many times you supposed to forgive a person? They said 70 times 7. I, and I said, okay, then. That's what we do. We forgive. You know. But pastor, you're a pastor. That's why you, see, you got to do it. I ain't got to go. I said, okay, then. And that's what, you know. So a person praying while bearing a grudge, however, is like a tree sprouting leaves. And leaves are bearing no fruit. And the leaves are bearing no fruit. Going back to that fig tree. <laughs> True faith changes the heart. Real, real prayer dismantles pride. Real prayer will dismantle pride. That pride going to go out the window. And, and a vengeance Filling the holes with love. He said, vengeance is his. He will repay. We, we can't handle but so much. But God can handle it all. Uh -huh. Real faith seeks peace. 
for our churches to have prayer, power, harmony, and forgiveness, it must be evident in the body of believers. Hallelujah. Sisters and brothers, let go of the hurts, abandoned grudges, and forgive one another. Amen? Hallelujah. This is a pretty uh, short chapter tonight, but last, verse 27 through 33, Jesus' author authority questioned. His authority was questioned. <clears throat> Starting at verse 27, it says, they came again to Jerusalem. And as Jesus was walking in the courts and porches of the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him and began saying to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do these things? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question and you answer me. And then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Verse 30. Was the baptism of John the Baptist from heaven, that is, ordained by God, or from men? This is what he asked them. And for the ones that have been following me, we, we studied about John the Baptist. And you know what happened to him. And you know what's getting ready to happen to Jesus in this passage. He's getting ready for his crucifixion. And he knows. And John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. And he, his head was cut off because he, he outwardly rebuked. So he was in the, in authority. He rebuked this king. And <laughs> for sleeping with his sister's, with his, um, brother's wife, he rebuked him openly. And but he knew that John the Baptist was a man of God. But he had this power. And they say this woman was dancing all in front of him. And he desired her. I mean, well, she was with him, but she belonged to somebody else. And John the Baptist rebuked her. He stood for righteousness. And the king had authority. And she was just dancing all around him. And everybody was enjoying her dance. And she, he said, I'll give you anything that you so desire. And it, he, she went back to her mother. And she said, Mom, he said he'll give me. What should I ask for? She said, ask for John's head, head on a platter. She went back to the king and asked and told the king she wanted John the Baptist's head on a platter. The Bible said that it grieved him because he knew that John the Baptist was a man of God. Who was standing for righteousness. Hallelujah. So they come. Here come Jesus. Hallelujah. Triumphant in Jew, Jerusalem. During the P Passover. And uh, so this is why he says this here. He said by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority? And Jesus said to him. I will ask you one question. And you answer me. And then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. He said, was the baptism of John the Baptist from heaven that is ordained by God or from men? Hallelujah. Answer me. They began discussing it with each other. Saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, then why did you not believe him? Hallelujah. But shall we say from men, they were afraid to answer because of the crowd. Hallelujah. For everyone considered John to have been a, a real prophet. So they replied to Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus Christ could have told it. Jesus Christ is concerned about everybody's soul. He loves everybody. But my sisters and brother, the religious leaders were in a dilemma. They had wanted to trap Jesus. I always tell you, beloved, get close to him. Get in his word. Hallelujah. Because if we don't, God loves you. But just right here, there's coming a time they didn't answer Jesus truthfully. 
and he comes back and said, I will not answer you. Because he knew, he knew that they were up to no good. They had wanted to trap him. If Jesus said his authority was from God, they would have said that he was blaspheming. If he said that his authority was from his own, they would dismiss him and say that he was a fanatic. Keep walking with me. Jesus had countered their questions with a question about John the Baptist. Now they would have to try to save face. Hallelujah. They, they had not stood up for John or tried to get him released. Beloved John had irritated them and so was Jesus. And this is found in Matthew 3. 7 through 10. We covered it. Hallelujah. For the ones that want to go back. These religious leaders. Were only concerned. In their positions. And reputations. They were not looking for the truth. He knew that. The Messiah knows all things. In John 3. 19. Jesus some, uh, summed up this attitude. This is what he said. He said people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. People who reject Jesus, beloved, claims have, have a greater problem with intellectual doubt. The, the, re, the, rebellion, the rebellion against Christ's control of their lives is really what the issue is. That's why they rebel. They don't want to surrender all to Jesus. They try to ask tricky questions like these religious leaders did, but they don't really want answers. Sincere seekers, beloved, will find the truth. Sincere seekers will find the truth. They will seek out the truth. Huh. Sincere seekers will find the truth. I want to ask you a question. Do you have a desire, a sincere desire to know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Tonight is your night. Romans 10, 9 and 10. It's very simple. Man makes it hard. These religious leaders made it hard. But Jesus said, I'm not going to answer you because they're, they were tricky. They didn't really know, want to know. But I ask you, do you want to know him? You sincerely want to know Jesus tonight. Tonight is your night. Romans 10, 9 and 10. It said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Repeat after me if you sincere tonight. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. I believe Jesus. I believe that you sent your only begotten son to die on the cross for me. And on the third day, he rose again. I, I confess it and I believe it by faith. And just begin to get on the journey. If you repeated that after me, welcome into the family of God. The Bible said that the angels of the Lord are rejoicing in heaven. And I rejoice with them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We give him glory. We give him honor. We give him praise. Hosanna to the highest. Save me, I pray. Hallelujah. If you've been on this journey, you've allowed situations, circumstances, you, you know, it might be it's so many deaths now, death after death. And you had a situation that you just don't understand. You got tired because you said, God, enough. Why, God, why? Trust him. He's the only one that can help you. He's the only one can pull you out of it. That mindset. He's the only one. And he, I'm a living witness. He would do it. So repeat after me. If you left God. Acts 3 verse 19. It says repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And he promised that a time of refreshing will come to you. Hallelujah. Say, Lord Jesus, I repent for my sins. Help me with my attitude, my, my, my choice tonight, God, to turn back to you. I need your help. Help me to stay focused on you. I have a sincere desire. And I thank you, God, for refreshing, a time of refreshing in my life. I need it, God. 
And forgive me, Father, for turning away and help me. Help me, Lord. I need you. Help me in my weakness, God. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. To God be the glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We give God all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Mark 11 was a short chapter. The next one is a pretty long. It's longer. But we thank God, amen, for another opportunity to study his word with his people. We give him glory. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you. I thank you, God, for another opportunity to get in your word, Father. There is no one like you. I pray, God, that this word would, this word would take root in our lives and grow. Give us a heart and mind to want to even spend more time with you, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, help us, God, the ones under the sound of my voice, to cast all their cares on you because you carry for them, God. You tell us, God, that weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. It's some trying times right now. It's hard for all of us, God, but we know that if we cast all our cares on you, that you carry for us. And Lord, we give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You be blessed, my sisters, and be blessed, my brothers, until Sunday morning, 1030 a.m. Have a blessed rest of the week. Good night. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.